I think we can all agree that 2023 has been a massive year for FNAF fans. Between the release of Ruin, Help Wanted 2, and of course, the FNAF movie, there's been quite a bit to talk about. On top of all of that, there were also a plethora of FNAF fan games announced and released in the latter half of this year. I wanted to compile my favorites into one bingeable video. You'll hear about the game made by the team behind the biggest FNAF NFT project and maybe scam, the banned FNAF 3 Plus, a remastered edition of one of the most controversial fan games of all time, and a bonus video that hasn't been posted to this channel yet about FNAF in Texas. If you're watching this in 2026, how is the second FNAF movie? Has the world ended yet? Mascot Horde. That newfangled little term that everyone is throwing around nowadays. We have FNAF, Poppy Playtime, Hello Neighbor, Garden of Ban Ban, and a bunch of other fan games that are trying to start their own franchises. We're getting more, and we're gonna keep getting more whether we like it or not. That's right, Mascot Horror is getting another brightly colored face to capture the sub goldfish attention span of the iPad kids. Susie Snack Time. Wait a second. Susie Snack Time? Poppy Playtime? Snack time play. Okay, then. Even though Candyland just got an early development trailer in early April, it and the person behind it have already been pretty well known on the internet in both good and bad ways. Enough YouTube introing. Let's dive into the history of the most infamous FNAF fan project ever made. The story of Candyland starts with the YouTube channel Golden Lane Studios. It was created on April 26th. 2010 by someone named Roman, and it was originally named J.S. Machinima. Its first video was a teaser for a Silent Hill mod for Half-Life 2, so the guy behind this channel has been invested in horror from the very start, as we can see. After this, they made some various SFM horror game animations until they discovered and made an animation on a very influential game in November of 2014. I bet you can guess exactly what that game was. They must have had some success with that first FNAF video, because the next video that they made was a concept trailer for FNAF 3. And guess when they posted it? And guess where it happens to take place? November 18th, 2014. One week after the release of FNAF 2. Today it's sitting at a relaxed 16 million views, so I think a couple people may have watched it. As for the setting of this supposed FNAF 3, it's a Freddy Fazbear mall complex. This trailer was extremely high quality for the age of the channel. And the success of this video shows you where the rest of this story might be going. JS wanted as much of that massive FNAF pie as they could get. So they made FNAF animations the main focus of their channel. And it worked. The animation that he made directly after the fan made trailer got over 30 million views and almost every one of the 29 FNAF episodes that they made over the years has millions, if not tens of millions of views. Over time, the animations increased in quality as more and more FNAF games and characters came out alongside them. The JS Machinima channel became the single largest FNAF animation channel, and it was safe to say that they had a bright future ahead of them if they kept it up. Sadly, what I just said wasn't exactly 100% safe to say. Right in the middle of 2021, things really started to slow down for the channel. They had switched to Unreal Engine 5 for their animations instead of Source Filmmaker, better known as SFM, and the animations were looking better than ever, but it wasn't enough. The SCP, Backrooms, and FNAF related videos consistently started getting less than 1 million views for the first time in years. JS was facing the challenge that many other YouTubers dread. The situation where they needed to change up their content soon or else they would slowly fade into obscurity. The same thing just wasn't going to work anymore. They made actually a couple of official animations for Apex Legends and Call of Duty, which one would think should have helped their channel receive some much needed exposure, but it just didn't work. On June 3rd, 2022, a Backrooms animation was uploaded that sits at 142,000 views today. An extreme low point for the channel, although that's not that bad, all things considered. This appears to be the push that really inspired JS to start working on something different. On August 19th, 2022, the Candyland Twitter account posted a short but extremely polished animation of a partially built animatronic face coming to life. Two days later, a dancing silhouette of what appeared to be a finished version of that same animatronic face 
was posted saying five hours left. After the countdown ended, Candy, the new face of Candyland, was shown in his full glory. He was a kangaroo animatronic who looked like a mix of Candy, see the name similarity, and Funtime Foxy from the original FNAF series. What is this new project that they're starting with these animatronics? Is it a fan game or like a short film, another animated series like they were doing on their YouTube channel? Hashtag NFT. Okay, I know people are sick of hearing about NFTs, so if you don't want an overview of what an NFT is, skip to this timestamp, but I really think it's important to understand what an NFT is for what I'm about to tell you. So here we go. When people heard that Candyland had a line of NFTs, they immediately assumed that it was a scam, and I completely understand why. By now, you probably already know that NFT stands for non-fungible token. Fungible means able to be replaced, and non-fungible means individual, non-replaceable. For example, if you wanted the original microphone that Freddy Fazbear holds in the FNAF movie, you probably wouldn't be satisfied with a microphone of the same model. You specifically want the microphone used in the movie, because it's special to you. That microphone would be non-fungible. It's the only FNAF movie microphone, making it valuable to some people. That is essentially how an NFT works. When you buy an NFT, you digitally become the official owner of some digital item, like a picture for example. Of course, people can just screenshot it if they want to look at it. But, like a painting, it's the official ownership of the official real thing that makes it special. Why do some people think that all NFTs are a scam? Because of the many fiascos involving big YouTubers, cryptocurrencies, and NFTs. Like Logan Paul and iShowSpeed, which always turned out to be poor investments at best and downright scams at worst. Because of the rocky history of big NFT projects run by YouTubers, it's easy to understand why people would assume that this is a scam. But what is the end goal that this project is using NFTs to fund? It's Susie Snack Time, making her very original looking debut with her very original name, with her very innocent design. There's a very loaded future for this character that I'll get to very, very soon. On October 14th, 2022, the first video of the animated Candyland series was posted to YouTube, and it received a lot of attention mostly because of the sheer quality of this animation. It shows Candy the Kangaroo performing, then going backstage to what looks like his charging pod. A mysterious man wearing a mouse mask comes in and does something on a laptop in the room that causes Candy's eyes to turn red and start to malfunction. Whatever the mouse man had tried to do didn't work as intended because it says, firmware update failed. Candy walks back to his performing area, but it's empty and he continues to glitch out as his eyes turn even redder, or more red. I'm not kidding when I tell you that these are movie levels of quality when it comes to the visuals. Five days later, Tukey Toucan was revealed on Twitter, and on November 5th, Mr. Smiles made his grand entrance, and it was announced that all of the characters had been revealed. Now it's time for Phase 2. If you thought that things seemed a little off in Phase 1, you haven't seen nothing yet. On October 3rd, a dedicated Suzy Snack Time channel was created, just over a month after the character was revealed on Twitter. The way that Suzy was designed was, was just a little too perfect for YouTube Shorts and TikToks, and Golden Lane definitely knew that with the way some of these videos are presented. The content is completely family friendly as far as I can see, but the character design mixed with the titles are intended to get certain people's attention in a certain way. And that's all I'll really say about that. And this carried over to the full episodes, which heavily featured Susie instead of the main mascot in episodes 3 and 4. She kneels in front of a lonely kid with a stuffed rabbit in a back room. Her mouth falls off in front of the kid, and tension slowly builds as the kid asks if she's okay. In this video, a really cool and interesting aspect of Susie's character design is highlighted. She has a mouth, but it doesn't move at all meaning that her facial expression pretty much always remains the same, even when she speaks using her voice box. And this character design really clicked with a lot of people, since the channel for Suzy Snack Time now has over 400,000 subscribers. On November 16th, they announced a grand opening that allowed those who interacted to have a chance to win a golden ticket, which I must say is some very clever Willy Wonka theming for a project called Candyland. After this, it was just more NFTs of different variants of the four main characters like Queen Susie Snack Time, Christmas Candy, 
and Susie with a rainbow sword for whatever reason. Huge amounts of people were complaining about Candyland in the comment section though, because they wished that these fantastically designed characters and amazing visuals in the videos could be used for something more substantial, like an actual game for example. Roman and their team are insanely talented at what they do, and it really is a shame to see them use those talents just to sell expensive pictures, when they could be making more money by making more interactive content. Episode 3 came out on YouTube on March 17th of 2023, showcasing Tuki the Toucan doing his thing with playing cards. After he gets done with his performance, he heads backstage to see Susie standing there, still missing her mouth. As she twitches and stares at Tuki, what on earth am I saying right now? She holds the toy that belongs to the girl that she talked to in the previous episode, but there's no sign of the girl. The episode ends with her saying, Hi there. There is one big misconception about the nature of the Candyland NFT project. These NFTs exist to help fund the Candyland project. They aren't Roman's main goal here, they aren't the project. I understand why some people think it's a scam, like Vexidus and his videos about the series, and I think I'm pronouncing that name right, but scam or not, the creator is actually trying to make a product with these characters, not just digital pictures. Now we're here at April 6, 2023. We see Susie snack time sitting on the floor of an abandoned mall complex her mouth detached from her face again, and she suddenly boots up, puts on her mouth, and looks around. Showing Susie looking around curiously like this in the beginning of the trailer makes it seem like we might actually be playing as Susie in the game, which would be an interesting choice. We hear voice lines from someone who sounds almost exactly like the hand unit from the FNAF games. But they wouldn't do as they were told. But as my brother once said, anything can be fixed with a little smile. And apparently his brother said that anything can be fixed with a smile, as we see Mr. Smiles jump into the action. We see a doorway and glowing red eyes appear in the darkness behind it, along with a hand holding out a lollipop to us. The rest of the trailer shows us stunning shots of other locations of the mall. And there we are. This is the product that all the NFTs and thirst traps existed to fund. It looks very similar to Security Breach and setting and animation, a little callback to their FNAF 3 concept trailer, though hopefully it's a little bit less overambitious than Steel Wool was. The characters are well designed, the story is written, the characters act, and it's safe to say that the visuals are going to be breathtaking no matter what. The whole hand unit voice and the my brother is now an evil robot who used to be the co-founder of this place is disturbingly close to the plot of FNAF but they could still surprise us with the story. Now let's talk about FNAF 3. It's, it's a controversial one. It seems like people either love it or hate it. Okay, scratch that, most people think it's just mediocre. There are two main reasons for this, the gameplay and the jump scares. The main complaints about the gameplay are that it is slow and a little too easy as compared to the utter chaos of FNAF 2. The main complaints about the jump scares are very similar, being that once again, they're a little bit too slow. But to be fair, the FNAF 2 jump scares weren't all that great either. And that's where FNAF 3 Plus comes in. Or as I should say, Fazbear Fright's Attraction. In the later nights, its gameplay produces situations that are nearly just as frantic as the ones in FNAF 2. And it straight up borrows another mechanic from it. At the beginning of night one, we are dropped into an interactive cutscene of sorts where we are forced to walk up to Fazbear Frights, our new work location. We are able to sort of look side to side, but we can only walk forward. This gives a feeling of being trapped because even though we can look from side to side and we should be free to do what we want, all we can really do is walk straight forward to our doom. And the building looms over us and it seems like the closer we get to the door, the slower we get until the scene fades out. The office is almost identical to the one from the original game, except RTX on. If we flip up our maintenance panel, we can see a little version of Helpy, a map of the ventilation system with a hold to use ventilation button. We also have a new reboot option, reset cooling system. I'll explain how that works a little bit later. There are no phantoms and no spring trap at all in this night, just like in the first game. Unnerving but subtle ambience plays throughout the whole night. Here's where things get more interesting. Now, Phantom Balloon Boy and Phantom Foxy are active, and they found one. 
A real one. There are no phone calls in this game, by the way. Balloon Boy works precisely the same as he does in the first game. You can't look at him too long, except switching cameras doesn't get rid of him. You have to put down your monitor to avoid his jump scare. Phantom Foxy also works the same as he initially did. If you see him in your peripheral vision as you turn to your maintenance panel, look away, flip up the camera, and he'll disappear. If you look all the way over at him, he'll step out of the screen and your maintenance panel is disabled for a few seconds and then he'll get you a few seconds later. Springtrap is pretty easy to deal with as long as you don't get a ventilation error, especially since he can't enter the vents at all. I'll discuss why he can't enter the vents in my final thoughts. Now that it's night two, some errors start showing up. Audio errors, there's a lot of variability. Sometimes you get two audio uses before it breaks, sometimes you get five, it's all about luck. You don't really need to worry about video errors on this night. Ventilation errors are precisely the same as in the first game. They occur at random times or when you get hit by a phantom. You can probably already see some teamwork that the gang of phantoms can use to make your life miserable here. You have to flip up your monitor to get rid of Foxy if you spot him, and that's exactly where Balloon Boy will probably be waiting for you. Now let's talk about how the new mechanics come to play in Night 2. The hold to use ventilation button is basically just the music box. You have to hold it to keep this little bar from reaching your office. I did a little experiment to see what happens if you don't wind up the ventilation. So if I can pull this off, let's just see what happens if we let this little bar expire. He still hasn't moved yet as far as I know. What happens if we reset? And he's here. I didn't hear any walking from him. It just gets him right up to our door. And I think it makes ventilation errors happen way more often. As for the cooling system errors, they're a bit like ventilation errors. They pop up at random, but they drain your oxygen meter. More on the oxygen meter later. All you need to know now is bar reach office and oxygen go down equals bad. I think Phantom Freddy joins the party for night three, but I could be wrong. He may be there from night two. Regardless, FNAF 3 plus Phantom Freddy works a lot differently. Instead of jump scaring you if you stare at him for too long, he jump scares you if you don't stop him with perfect timing. How do we stop him? We have this little lever in front of us that activates the window blinds. You have to hold them down right as Freddy finishes his journey across your window to prevent his jump scare. Easy enough, right? No. This mechanic gets miserable in later nights, all because of Phantom Puppet. Now we have to deal with the puppet too. Out of all of the Phantom animatronics, the puppet has definitely been changed the most here. Just for a quick recap, the puppet in the original game would block your vision for a while if you stared at it for too long when it appeared in Cam 8. In this game, the puppet behaves a lot more like the original Phantom Freddy. It swings down into your office every once in a while, and if it catches you not looking at some kind of panel for about two seconds or so, you get a jump scare. This makes dealing with the puppet and Freddy at the same time literally impossible, unless you have frame perfect timing, maybe, and even then I think you would have to hold down the blinds for too long to not get hit by the puppet. The only way to get rid of the puppet is to sit in your panel or your camera until it leaves, but it won't be gone for too long. I think Phantom Chica becomes active on Night 5. You might be wondering why I'm so uncertain about things. I'll explain. Because this game is a remake of FNAF 3, so close to the original, it's technically illegal. Therefore, it's only available through some random person putting it up on Game Jolt. This means that you can never really know if the item you're buying doesn't have something undesirable hiding inside. Roll is Games got a lot of attention for playing through this fan game, and recently he said that the version he got was apparently a Trojan, which is a type of virus. Upon hearing that, I deleted my copy of the game, so if you want to go looking for it, do so at your own risk. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, I'm not really sure how Phantom Chica works. She appears on the arcade cabinet in Cam 7, just like in the OG game. She either gets you if you look at Cam 7 twice when she's on the screen, or she just gives you a split second of time to get off of her camera. I'm not really sure, I just know that I just stopped looking at Cam 7 at all because I did not know how to deal with her. This whole time I've been talking about this game as if it works perfectly as intended. It definitely has some quirks to it. I just wanted to take a second to shout out the three members that I currently have. The three members that I currently have, Tyler Feller, Doodle, Star of the Cosmos, thank you so much. It's a great way to support me and you get some exclusive perks like shout outs and all long form videos starting from now on. Thanks. First of all, the creator did say that the game is unfinished. 
This is apparent because the extras menu shows Phantom Bonnie, but there is no Phantom Bonnie present in the gameplay, unless he's some easter egg that I missed somewhere. Same thing with Phantom Mangle. Second of all, the oxygen meter basically does nothing. Once your oxygen dips below the 80s or 70s or maybe the 100s, your screen starts getting darker and darker and darker until you reach zero. But nothing happens when you hit zero. You can still complete the night even if you're on 0% oxygen for hours. The Night 5 AI is also very broken for some strange reason. Phantom Freddy disappears. Phantom Foxy isn't very aggressive at all. The only animatronics that are aggressive are the puppet and Balloon Boy. And Springtrap only moves if you get a ventilation error, or at least barely moves. In my copy of the game at least, it's possible to beat Night 5 just by sitting in your maintenance panel and fixing ventilation errors and winding up the music box, which wouldn't be possible if Phantom Freddy was in play. And that brings up the issue of Phantom Freddy. I tried the nightmare mode for a while, and I'm not sure if it's possible. Okay, I'm sure that it's possible, but only through extremely lucky circumstances. The main problem is Phantom Freddy and Phantom Puppet. If Puppet is in your office when Freddy shows up, it is literally impossible not to get hit by Freddy because you have to hold up the blinds for a couple seconds to get rid of Freddy. But if you're not looking at one of your panels, you'll get hit by the Puppet. Also, your maintenance panel gets disabled for seemingly no reason, which creates problems because that makes you vulnerable to the Puppet and then you have to use your cameras and then you can't fix errors. So the whole thing is just a horrible experience as far as the nightmare mode. Overall, this game was meant to be the perfect answer to the issue issues that many fans have with the third FNAF game. It has a satisfying and intuitive gameplay loop, it brings on panic inducing and chaotic moments in later nights, and it does have one more important thing. It fixes Springtrap's jump scare. It's quick, it's jarring, and Springtrap has never looked better in my opinion. You can see the corpse of Afton inside the suit, and it's over in the blink of an eye. It doesn't last an eternity like the original one does. But the game also has its issues. Besides the unfinished nature of certain mechanics and certain entire nights that don't really work, you have to go through a 30 second cutscene before each night, which makes every death feel like more of a punishment than it should be. All of this makes this FNAF fan game the one that almost fixed FNAF 3. Oh yeah, and then there's the fact that this is a copyright infringing potential virus. In early 2018, a few months before Ultimate Custom Night was released, a little FNAF fan game came out. It was called Dormitibus. Large creators like Markiplier and Daco featured the game on their channel, and it went on to become infamous in the FNAF community for its interesting writing and even more interesting creator. Interesting not being a good thing in this case. It advertised itself as one game, but it had all the lore of at least two games, if not an entire franchise. Dormitibus got a lot of attention because it wasn't like other FNAF fan games. And recently, it got a remaster, made by a team who was not involved with the original creator at all. My question is, does Dormitibus Remastered fix its predecessor? Let's get into Dormitibus, the original. The first night begins with our character sitting in a chair in the back of a horrific room. Remember when I said that Dormitibus was released right before Ultimate Custom Night? I said that for a reason. Everything looks a bit like FNAF 3. Green tinted, slimy, and generally disheveled. Some of the chairs and stools in the room are knocked over, the ducks look like snakes slithering up the walls, and two massive gaping doors sit at the other end of the room. Pressing W allows us to run to the other side of the desk, giving us access to a PC and a better look at the two doors. Once at the other side of the room, we have four different places to look. Up at the roof, behind at the window, left and right. If we're looking straight ahead, we can press control to turn on our monitor where expanding the minimized window gives us access to the cameras. We've got a phone call from someone named Peter, who refers to us as John. He tells us that we're in an eternal purgatory. The location we're in is an amalgamation of our memories of Fredbear's family diner, and a different type of amalgamation is just about to start hunting us. Peter says he has a plan to get us out of here, but the plan isn't ready yet. He tells us to hang in there for him, and that he's not sure if our friends will be hostile tonight or not, and hangs up the call, and we're on our own. For tonight, everything seems fine though, until we hear this. The only animatronic active on night one is Havoc Freddy. Okay. Hey, oh, hi, Fred Mangle, Mangle Freddy. Oh, okay. He looks like a mixture of Springtrap, Mangle, and Phantom Freddy. He sets the theme for any of the core animatronics design in this game, 
with Springtrap's withered and rotten exterior and Mangle's jumbled mess of endoskeleton. If you hear clanking noises, that means Phantom Freddy is on the move, and he'll eventually loom at your door directly behind you or right next to you. When he appears in either of these two places, run to the other side of the room. This gets rid of him very quickly. Night 1 is primarily an office tour and lore exposition session, but just wait until night 5. That's when things start to go absolutely bonkers. I almost forgot to mention, every night in Dormitibus is 9 hours long, 10pm to 7am, every night. Before the night ends, everything goes dark and this little audio stinger plays. The thing is, that's the exact same thing that happens whenever you get jump scared. So whenever you complete a night, there's always a few seconds where you wonder if you just lost or if you just won. Same thing for when you get jump scared. You're not quite sure if you just won the night or if you just lost. But this does suck all tension out of any jump scares that you do get because the black screen serves as a great jump scare incoming warning sign. In fact, it's such a good jump scare incoming sign that I'm gonna start using it in my videos. Two more animatronics become active on night two and Peter gives us some more lore. He tells us that the animatronics are attacking us because we are made out of plasma and they're souls that need more plasma because they're incomplete. The new animatronics of the night are Cake Bear and Havoc Chica. Havoc Chica has Springtrap's green and decomposing body mixed with the unnaturally long limbs of the puppet. Her cupcake also has the Springtrap aesthetic and its candle is always faintly glowing. When we hear her laugh in our right doorway, we run to the other side of the room and look to the left. She disappears after a few seconds and her cupcake scuttles towards us, giving us just enough time to run back to the desk. If we take too long to run away or run back to the desk, Chica's cupcake jump scares us. There's no Havoc Chica jump scare in Dormitibus, as far as I know. Cake Bear is the other animatronic introduced to us on night two. He's based on the bear from the Save Him minigame in FNAF 2. He holds a smooth and sentient birthday cake with teeth in one hand and has no ears for some reason. Peter likes to call him Am I Real because he can change himself into a spring trap version of Cake Bear at will. When Cake Bear moves to a different room, he says the number of the corresponding camera. If we don't select that camera, Cake Bear will eventually become green and mangled and hallucinations of him will appear on the cameras and eventually his cake will kill us. We don't have to always watch him when he's on the cameras, as long as we have the right camera selected, he can't attack us. On the third night, Peter doesn't have much lore to offer. He mainly explains the new animatronics that have come to play, but that's my job. Soul Cage is a watermelon with four claw-shaped legs and four heads, each with one glowing yellow eye and a mouthful of extremely sharp teeth. Those four heads are the heads of Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy. After Soul Cage jumps at us from our right door, he'll crawl up to our ceiling, where we have to look at him until he leaves. As we stare at him on the ceiling, some really well executed horror strings play, it really adds to the atmosphere of the situation. The other animatronic is Molten Evil, who is basically confirmed to be RWQFSFASXC with white tear stains all over their face and chest. According to Peter, they're the original source of the plasma that created all of the others. Our vision is obscured by a chaotic blue overlay when he shows up, and this distorted sound effect plays. To get rid of him, we have to play dead by looking at the scene. Night 4 only adds one more animatronic, Havoc Puppet, which takes Nightmarion's design and absolutely runs with it. Its face looks just like Nightmarion's, almost, except it's a lot wider and thicker. It has a bunch of moist and putrid looking tentacles that seem to be coming out of its mouth. It's a very, very strange concept. It appears behind us along with a slowed down version of the music box from FNAF 2 and all we have to do is turn around and stare at it until we stop hearing the music and it disappears. Like I said earlier, night 5 is where things really start to go off the rails. Peter gives us an interesting detail about Golden Call, one of the new animatronics of the hour. Uh, you know that new enemy I mentioned? It's me. 
well, it's not really me. Uh, to be exact, it's my physical remainings from back in 1993. Uh, yeah, I've been here for a while, if you couldn't guess by my knowledge of these ghosts. Golden Call will occasionally cover the screen with a voicemail notification, and to delete that voicemail, we have to head over to Cam 5, where Foxy's out of order sign will have a secret code for us, and the password to the voicemail deletion thing will be the longest word on the pirate code message. So we have to type in the longest word that we see on the sign to get rid of Golden Call. And after we get rid of Golden Call, Foxy will come out of his curtains. So we have to run to the other side of the room and then look to the right to stare at Foxy. This gets really complicated whenever any other character is added to the mix because you have to weigh which one is more important and decide which one you're gonna deal with first. And if you make the wrong decision, you're done for. As far as the character designs, these two are a very strange duo. Golden Call is like a zombie version of Golden Freddy. It reminds me a lot of the FNAF 1 game over screen because the eyes are popping out of the suit. He also has a phone that's I think is attached to his brain but it's attached with this sticky red film and he pulls away from it sometimes and he's also green like pretty much every animatronic is in this game and Havoc Foxy I feel so bad for him. His design really really missed the mark mostly because of the crotch hand. Once again all the Foxy's, Freddy's, Chica's, things like that in these games have a very mangle inspired design and in Foxy's case his body is made up of an arm pointing down but the hand ends up being right where his crotch would be. He also has an arm that's always in his mouth for some reason that's holding a little sign. I cannot take this character design seriously at all. Another thing that I stumbled upon in my playthrough of Dormit Abyss was an Easter egg, kind of like the FNAF 1 Golden Freddy Easter egg, where Golden Call appears on your desk and crashes the game. Night 6 as the final animatronic in the main gameplay loop. B-O-A, or Box of Abominations, but I like to call him Boa. Boa has a mangle style body with all five heads of the toy animatronics, which all appear to be slightly melted. When you see it in the right doorway, you have to run to the other side of the room, then look to the left and look at it until it leaves. When I first saw this in my playthrough, I thought it was Soul Cage for the first five times that I saw it. So I died many, many times to Boa because I was waiting for him to run up to the ceiling, but it doesn't behave that way. <laughs> Nights 7 through 9 increase the difficulty of existing characters instead of adding new ones, and the story starts to ramp up. Peter tells us that something big is walking around this purgatory, and if it is what he thinks it is, we're all done for. This is foreshadowing for the big final battle on Night 10, but I'll get to Night 10 when we talk about the remastered edition. Dormitibus's gameplay is a mixed bag. Nine characters are introduced throughout six nights and things get really complicated really quickly. Nine characters may sound manageable since the second FNAF game had 10 characters and Ultimate Custom Night had a couple more, but the thing about Dormitibus is, but the thing about Dormitibus is, each character has a specific sequence of actions that you have to take and if you mess up that sequence, you're dead. I love the concept of having to look at some animatronics to drive them away, but also having to hide from other ones like Havoc Freddy. Cake Bear's mechanic is an evolution of FNAF one Foxy's gimmick. He's a moving threat that you have to keep track of instead of a stationary one. Although I wish they had given him more distorted and mysterious voice lines because the Darth Vader vibes in his voice end up coming across really goofy. The idea of rushing to the desk while Chica's cupcake audibly scuttles towards you is brilliant. Molten Evil's hallucinations create some very stressful situations, especially if they combine with another animatronic because it almost completely obscures your vision. Soul Cage's little bite animation and Boa's voice line are very intimidating and the over-the-top designs work very well in the dark and squalid environment. And then there's Golden Call and Havoc Foxy. Don't get me started on them. If they combine with any other animatronic, it just makes things so stressful for that five second period. Especially considering that you have to also remember what camera Cake Bear is in after you get done dealing with them because they force you to change camera. Dormitibus's gameplay can get very complicated in later nights, which makes it very rewarding to succeed in, but also very frustrating to die in. The biggest problem I have with this game are its visuals. The office looks all grainy and 
and it's overly bright, surprisingly, for a FNAF office, which makes some of the renders look worse because it looks like they artificially darken certain areas to make the renders look more creepy, but that makes it look even more grainy and more sharpened, and the cameras are even worse. Something about this looks off, and not in a creepy way. It looks off in a poorly designed kind of way. Dormitibus Remastered is incredible, I'll just say it right here and right now. It takes almost every aspect of the original and improves it drastically, especially in the visual field, which is where I have the most criticism for the original game. The environment in the original, like I said, grainy, not dark enough, well Dermitibus Remastered fixes this. There are actual shadows now. These shadows do the character models justice and their renders making them look much less like JPEGs and it makes the entire game easier on the eyes in general. But speaking of the characters, let's talk about the character changes in Dormitibus Remastered. Every single pre-existing animatronic has been redesigned or fixed in some way. All of the core four is here now. Before there was Havoc Freddy, Foxy, and Chica. Now we also have Bonnie. And all of them have actual color differences now. Before, everyone was pretty much the same shade of green, but now there's actually a diverse color palette. That's not to say that some of these character designs aren't still pretty goofy, but Dormitibus Remastered took all of them to their fullest potential. Havoc Bonnie has the same general design as the others, a mangle-shaped body with all the wrong limbs and incorrect places, but with one key feature. The FNAF 2 faceless Bonnie head protrudes from one side of his body, while the empty mask sits where the assembled head should go, and it works so incredibly well. Bonnie appears in the right doorway, and all you have to do to deal with him is look at him when he runs to the other side. The next character is Dawnbreaker. He has a very simple mechanic. When the clock strikes 6am, he has a chance to appear in one of the four areas near the computer desk. If you find him in the next few seconds, you automatically win the night. Dawnbreaker helps shave down the unnecessarily long runtime of some of the nights. Havoc Balloon Boy and JJ work as a team, both showing up in the left doorway. When Balloon Boy disappears from the doorway, you have to run to the other side of the room and look at him on the right. Him and JJ both look like Halloween props in the best way possible. They have faces reminiscent of jack-o'-lanterns, faded and tattered clothing, and grotesquely large claw-like fingers. Thankfully, the ridiculously difficult duo, Golden Call and Havoc Foxy, were completely changed in this version. Golden Call now works exactly the same as Havoc Puppet, except with a phone call sound effect instead of the music box, which is a shame because it makes him useless to the gameplay, but I think they just wanted to continue using his design in the game and for his role in the lore, which I think is fair. Havoc Foxy will gradually exit his curtain, eventually leaving with a loud metallic scraping sound. Once he's gone, his sign will have an arrow pointing either right or left, telling us what side to look at after we run to the other side of the room to stop him. He still looks ridiculous, but I can look past that because of the nice gameplay change. Also, no more crotch hands, so that's a plus. The last added animatronic is Spring Glitch, who serves as a more reasonable replacement for Golden Call's mechanic. He causes an error code to appear on the monitor, and we have to switch the corresponding cameras in the same sequence as the numbers on the code to get rid of him. This creates some really tense but less unfair situations similar to Golden Call in the original game. His model looks like a mixture of Withered Freddy and Springtrap, which I'm not a massive fan of, but again, good gameplay so I can forgive it. Here we are, we finally made it to night 10, the final-ish night, where every animatronic is removed and replaced with Garvey. Yeah, the final boss's name of this game is Garvey. Garvey is the Dermitibus version of Springtrap, the corpse of Purple Guy, and the reason all of these incomplete souls are here. He has assumed some kind of supernatural form in purgatory. He's absolutely massive and apparently has the power to destroy incomplete souls. Garvey lectures us all night, scolding us for not coming here to save him, telling us that he did everything for us, and telling us that we have no idea how much pain he's in. His speech is kind of like Henry's FNAF 6 final speech. It's definitely not quite on the same level, but it's a huge step up from the original Dormitibus, because the voice acting in the original was nowhere near as good as it is here, and the distortion and effects that they put on his voice made it hard to understand. This version made it a whole lot more compelling. 
as soon as the night starts he is active it doesn't really give you much tutorial we have to look to the left and right depending on where we hear him laughing from or if we hear him laughing from both directions we have to look up he can also come at us through the vents which the vent system has been here throughout the entire game but now it's actually useful we'll see red arrows in the vents and hear a rumbling noise when he's on the way we have to click on that vent and then run to the other side of the room and look to the corresponding door to make sure he doesn't jump scare us if we're too slow on the vent thing and get there after him or even at the same time as him sometimes he'll just stare at us for a second and then grab us and end our night the boss night ends with a cutscene where garvey chases us through the building and then grabs us the game tells us to spam spacebar in this cutscene acting like it might save our lives and give us the good ending or something but i've never seen a video of someone succeeding in this and they get the bad ending every time which shows the gravestone of John Wright, our main protagonist. In the original game, his death date was 2017, but now it's 2008 in the remastered version. There are an optional extra two nights. Night 11 is a nightmare mode with every character active except Garvey in the remastered edition. In the original edition, Garvey replaces all of them at 5 a.m. Night 12 is a boss battle in a completely separate location with Cake Bear serving as the main threat. Because in this version of the lore, Cake Bears was the original establishment before Fred Bear's family diner. And this Night 12 takes us back to Cake Bears where we face off against him and Havoc Puppet one final time. Both of these nights exist to add extra challenge or provide more lore exposition, but neither are important for this video because we're here to talk about the gameplay. A video more focused on the story will be linked in the end screen for those who are interested. But first, was Dormitibus remastered worth it? The remastered characters managed to make goofy character designs look legitimately good. The original gameplay was almost unfair at times, and the remastered gameplay is much more satisfying and less frustrating while still remaining challenging. I already went over how the atmosphere was significantly improved in the remastered version, same goes for the Garvey voice lines in the boss fight. The remaster did have some characters that were absolutely useless to the gameplay still, like Havoc Puppet, Golden Call, JJ, Balloon Boy, and Withered Bonnie, but I'll let them slide because in a game like Dormitibus, having some extra filler characters makes the game feel more exciting and entertaining. The original game needed a remake, and the one we got was amazing. Around two weeks ago, a little FNAF fan game called A Bite at Freddy's was released, and it has the best gameplay I've ever seen in a FNAF fan game. It also does the one thing Security Breach needed to do, but never did. All of Security Breach's trailers and teasers try to make it look like some sick horror game, but we all know what the truth ended up being. On the other hand, A Bite at Freddy's advertises itself as a fun and silly game up front, and never tries to be what it isn't. Because of that honest marketing, I had a blast playing through this game, so much so that I ended up completing every single challenge and extremely difficult custom night, something I've never done in a fan game before. There's probably some plot relevance there. Are those Freddles? I just whacked my microphone. The game starts with a cutscene from Freddy's point of view, a bit like the opening cutscene in FNAF 2, but less terrifying. We can see a bit of Bonnie and Chica to either side of us, along with two shadowy figures in front of us. By what they're saying, it seems like one just repaired the animatronics, and that this location has been closed for a bit. Right as the cutscene fades out, one last line of text from the guy with the cowboy hat says, Hey, how about you stay around for a bit? I cook a mean, unintelligible. The text is gone so quickly that you have to pause it and look later to fully read it, meaning it must be important. My first thought was that the game was trying to tell us that we play as the technician who just fixed the animatronics, but I don't think that can be the case, because before we begin the first night, we circle a newspaper spot that only advertises a job involving testing the food delivery system. I think this is supposed to imply that this first guy didn't make it out of Freddy Fazbear's grill that night. Oh, I like that little- <laughs> Little Pac-Man endoskeleton mouth. That's beautiful. Let's see what the vibes are here. Earth doomed to implode. Wait. In this video, you'll be hearing from two people: Live Johnny and Narrator Johnny. Live Johnny can't hear me, no matter how loud I yell. What was that? Okay, so the first night is never usually that bad in any of the games, so I'll play. Howdy. I, was, I expected him to read out the whole thing, so I was just awkwardly waiting. Howdy! We're greeted by a beautiful phone with an equally beautiful hat, giving us an introduction to our new job at Freddy Fazbear's Grill. His hat looks exactly like the one Larry wears in that one VeggieTales story, so I'm calling this guy Larry for the rest of all time. He tells us that it's our job to sit in the office and confirm orders as they get to us, and we even get to eat the order. In our office, we have a lever to stop the conveyor belt and a button to shut off the lights in the office. In the cameras, we have the option to enable and 
disable the conveyor belt doors in certain cameras. When the food gets sent to its first stop, so the food's here. My food looks okay. This is the exact opposite of what you should do. You're supposed to click that massive glowing yellow button to confirm the order, not inspect the food. When an animatronic looks like it's about to climb into the food delivery system, you have to make sure to close the door. Otherwise, well, you'll see. What was that? Hi. When Chica enters your office, do not do this. I don't know why I didn't die right here. Also, the character designs in this game are fantastic. There will be a section dedicated to them in just a few minutes. Hopefully, Live Johnny shows us what we actually need to do when Chica shows up in our office soon. Use the toy pistol to get rid of- Oh, I have a- t Oh! Did I just waste my my one shot? No! Don't worry, you have infinite ammo. Here's a rare occurrence of Live Johnny actually knowing what he's doing the first time around. Bonnie? What do I- So I turn my power off with Bonnie, right? That's right. Bonnie is the only animatronic affected by the lights. Dealing with Chica is a bit less intuitive. Hi, Chica. Did I miss? If you fail to strike Chica right between the eyes with your gun, she'll jump scare you, which thankfully didn't happen here. If you hear anything fishy going on in the conveyor belts, pull the lever, and that somehow gets rid of whoever's in there. I don't like how that sounds. D am I too late? That seems like a good thing. And just a few short minutes later, this happened. Oh, wait. Does that mean I- While we figure out how to sort that out, let's review everything we learned from night one. Shut the conveyor belt door if an animatronic tries to crawl through it, shoot Chica between the eyes with the little toy gun if she appears behind your desk, and turn out the lights to make Bonnie leave when he shows up at the back of your office. This is why I love this game. It isn't necessarily scary, but like I said, it never claimed to be scary, and the game mechanics are just so unique and challenging. If it doesn't sound challenging yet, trust me, things escalate for poor live Johnny as we advance through the game. We replace the light bulb and move on to the second course. The second course is technically night two, we go back to the beginning of course too if we die, but as far as the storyline of the game goes, this is still our first night on the job. The base game consists of three courses, with an optional final course and an additional custom night. For course two, Larry introduces us to a new office mechanic, which somehow adds a new camera to the map. It's a vent camera. Now we have a conveyor belt to our left and a gaping vent directly above us. Said gaping vent is used only by Freddy. To stop him from getting to us, we have to block his path with our fan button. Where is Freddy? Oh, oh no. <laughs> as soon as Freddy became active, something strange happened. The voices in my head began telling me to wait until Freddy gets right up in front of the camera before activating the vent fan. But before Live Johnny could give in to said voices, this happened. Where is Chica? Let's go! I really don't want to trust you guys. I think I heard some of them rusty screws pop out in the conveyor. Am I gonna have to crawl into the conveyor? My hat's too big to fit inside there, so if you could head in and swap them out for me- This is the exact moment my relationship with Larry took a turn for the worst. I'll shut down the conveyor from my side. Do I trust you on that? No. But, you know what? Um, this is the one part of the game that I wasn't a big fan of, mostly because of the gameplay wasn't very intuitive. Larry has us removing and replacing screws in the conveyor, and we have to pull on these little guardrails in front of us, in front of the animatronics to stop them from reaching us. But if we click on a screw when an animatronic arrives, we can't activate the guardrail until we put the screw in its correct place. Just put in screws. You know what? The screw was stuck in my hand! What am I supposed to do if the screw is in my hand? Okay, that worked. I don't see a spot to put the screws in. Guys, guys, oh there we go. Oh, that's it? It's a cool minigame concept, but I'm not sad that it only lasts a couple minutes. Course 3, the night 5 of this game, introduces us to one new animatronic, Foxy. The member of the group with my personal favorite character design. I will definitely talk about that soon. Larry does his best to explain how Foxy works. If the cameras start having trouble, give them a refresh through the backstage camera. Is that a new- is it adding new cameras or no? If a robot messes with some old wires in the back, a refresh could shock them away. Okay, great, so we're shocking them now. He peeks out of his lab every now and again, and will eventually end up in Cam 9 with the camera wires in his mouth. So should I shock Foxy now? Yes, Johnny, they're in his mouth. You should probably shock him. I'm gonna shock him now. 
I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but he looks he looks angry whenever I do that. Live Johnny was finally able to get enough time to listen to the voices in his head and let Freddy get dangerously close before turning on the fan. I'm gonna wait for Freddy to get closer. Thanks for that. Uh, and his, his head is in my office. I'll take that. As fun as it is, if you want to win this game, never do this to Freddy. His headless body stays alive and becomes much more aggressive than normal Freddy. Foxy's back in his... <laughs> Freddy is mad. Oh no. I didn't know that was something Freddy could do. So you don't want to kill Freddy, because I just got rid of him. During the third course, I had a major realization. One that absolutely rocked my world. You see, this game has a twist villain. And like any good twist villain, he was right under our noses from the start. Why is that hat moving? Oh, it's the manager. Wait, then the manager's not any help. What are you doing in there? You're supposed to be helping me. You're just gonna watch the animatronics destroy me? <laughs> now that my trust in Larry is forever tarnished, I can move on to how it feels to play this game. Oh, I predicted that. <laughs> yes. That was such an... Ugh, I can't believe I got that one. Even following the simplest sound cues in this game is immensely satisfying. It made me feel like a genius every time I caught an animatronic in the conveyor belt system. The only thing more satisfying than blocking Chica or Bonnie is this. Oh. <gasps> yes, let's go. Let's go. Freddy ain't got nothing. Okay. Okay. Dude, what are you doing in Camp 5? Don't you... <laughs> Do you really not want to pay me that bad? That's all we need to do. Thanks for the all help. Right. Head over to the, the dining area. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sure. That's all we need to do. And I'll get you on your way. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's this has been a great work experience. It's entirely over. Oh, oh, wait, really? And so ends the base game. But wait, there's more. So much more. There's an optional fourth course called the final course, and it's more than just a more challenging version of the previous course. It includes one notable new character. I tell you, back in the day, this place was jumping. We had families in and out all day, new shows, events, the whole works. It all changed after the bite happened. Oh no. Some kid went up and bit a huge chunk right out of Fredbear's face. <laughs> Tore it right off. Oh. Now he just sits there all alone on his little stage inside the wall. The crew thinks he ought to be called Threadbear. That's such a good name. A bit crooked, ain't oh. it? In this universe, Fredbear was the bite victim, and he was left to rot like some kind of alternate version of Mangle, and he's now called Threadbear. You see what I mean about this game not trying to take itself too seriously? Even with his goofy origin story, Fredbear manages to be the most unsettling character in the game. That's Threadbear, I think. Is he replacing Freddy? Oh, hi. You're not supposed to be there, Threadbear. Although, I'd be a pretty funny reaction YouTuber. Ah, I shouldn't have refreshed the cameras. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, oh. <laughs> he glitches out in the cameras and has very unpredictable abilities. He can basically do anything the other characters can do, and then some. Like Larry said, he has the ability to block the conveyor belt, which drains at least half of your power to fix and other characters operate just as quickly as normal when he's doing it. Speaking of power, you probably won't ever run out of power in courses 1 through 3, but Threadbear can definitely make it happen on the final course, especially if he works together with any other character. When you do run out of power though, it isn't necessarily the end. In a bite at Freddy's, running out of power just means you have to wait for it to recharge, which takes around 15 seconds. The only problem is that you're only likely to run out of power in the later courses, where 15 seconds is almost a guaranteed death. Well now I'm dead. Especially since you only run out of power when you're trying to stop someone from getting to you. Oh! No shot! When you complete the game, you get a brief little cutscene again from Freddy's point of view, and after the cutscene, you get a cool newspaper saying that the characters have gone missing, and apparently Larry isn't all that upset about it. They've been acting all screwy for over years, for years, honestly, I'm not all too shaken. 
I'll buy this myself. The robots are great and all, but food is really the heart of it. If you want some good cooking and some big smiles, come on over. So that's all this game has to offer, right? Absolutely wrong. These character designs are peak, and they fit perfectly into the lighthearted overall tone of the game. Freddy looks unique and classic at the same time, and the whole talk box aesthetic is really, really cool. Somehow I went the entire game not realizing that they were crawling because they didn't have a lower half. Bonnie has the best outfit by far, Chica comes in with a close second, and she looks hilarious. Ever since we heard Rockstar Chica's voice lines in Ultimate Custom Nights, Southern Chica has felt canon to me. Threadbear is looking simultaneously creepy and goofy with his massive head bandage, but Foxy is my personal favorite. Something about his glasses mixed with his brown suit is hilarious and absolutely perfect to me. Larry's design is alright I guess. I just feel like he needs more Larry, you know? If you made it this far into the video, comment the most heinous war crimes you've witnessed Larry commit. I'll go first. Personally, he poisoned our water supply, burned our crops, and delivered a plague onto our houses. But that's just me. There are six main challenge modes in Abide at Freddy's, four of which add some unique game mechanics. The other two are the standard 510 and 520 modes, along with a secret Ultra Max Custom Night at the end of this section. The challenges are set up in a way to help you master each gameplay element in preparation for the 520 mode, aka the full course. The first challenge is Basket Hunt, where Wretched Manager Larry sends you six orders instead of the standard three. But here's the catch. The orders appear in random rooms in somewhat hard to spot locations, creating an extra layer of challenge to progress through the night. Freddy, Bonnie, and Threadbear are active, with the first two being set on difficulty 10 and the last being set on 5. The main goal of Basket Hunt is to get you comfortable quickly switching around the characters. Haunting Roulette is next, and this one is by far the most unique. Larry gives you a zap gun left by the technician at the beginning of the game, which uses a bit of your power each time you use it. When an animatronic enters its attack phase, it has a chance to haunt the corresponding object. The game makes it obvious when an object is being haunted, the screen loses saturation and hallucinations of the haunted item appear on screen. Oh, she didn't haunt it. I thought it was almost guaranteed that they would haunt if they got in the room like that. The easiest way to tell which item is haunted is to pay attention to which animatronic is approaching. This mode has every character except Threadbare, with half set to 5 and the other half set to 10. This mode helps you familiarize you further with dealing with each animatronic prevention element, and gives the developers an excuse to make a fan, lever, gun, and light switch jump scare. Cold Kitchen includes every animatronic except Foxy. This mode's unique element is the cameras freeze if you don't refresh them every few seconds. When they freeze, they essentially become unusable. This mode prepares you for just how many times you have to refresh the cameras when Foxy is set to max difficulty while still dealing with the other characters. Out of Service is my personal favorite. Bonnie and Chica are set to 10 and Freddy and Foxy are set to 5. The catch with this mode is that the conveyor belt is completely out of service, but animatronics can still get through it just fine. If one gets in, it's over. This challenge teaches you how to prevent Bonnie, Chica, and Freddy from getting into the conveyor belt, something you'll have to be good at in the final battle. The next mode is Lunch Rush. Larry sends six orders to us once again, and the animatronics are all set to 10. I'll be honest, the final course was easier than expected. After completing the challenge modes, it wasn't too hard to handle. If you complete the final course, you get this short cutscene showing the animatronics crawling through a field in the dark. Bit anticlimactic, isn't it? It would be if this were actually the 520 mode. The only way to play the real 520 mode is to manually set each animatronics difficulty level to 20, and then click ready. The difference in aggression is apparent right away. The first five normal nights of Abide at Freddy's are mostly about paying attention, but this mode adds a formidable resource management element. Most of my deaths came from losing power, and the ones that didn't came from me being so focused on quickly catching animatronics in order to conserve power that I didn't notice Bonnie or Chica in my office. You have to make sure to use each power hungry tool as briefly as possible to get rid of each animatronic, because of the sheer amount of times you'll need to stop them. If Freddy's head gets cut off at any point before Order 3 is on the way, you might as well reset the run, because a level 20 headless Freddy is virtually impossible to deal with group with the other max difficulty characters. Threadbear's mechanics really begin to shine in this mode, along with this really creepy camera render of him. He occasionally appears in Cam 9. If you don't refresh the cameras quickly enough, 
Threadbare jump scares and disables the cameras until you refresh them again. His conveyor jam ability is interesting on this final night. For one main reason, no one can get through the conveyor while it's jammed. If an animatronic tries to get into the conveyor while Threadbare has it jammed, they'll get stuck, meaning you only have to keep track of Freddy and Foxy until you decide to unjam Threadbare, meaning it's extremely helpful for Threadbare to jam the vents if too many things start piling up. The only downside is that the orders can't move forward while the conveyor is jammed, so it's basically a pause button for the night. After many, many attempts, I finally completed the real 520 mode, and I got this. Is there anything... Where's the... F That's all? <laughs> a Fredbear Finger Puppet. A Bite at Freddy's serves as a great breath of fresh air in the FNAF fan game space. It does the best job I've ever seen of making the cameras a vital part of gameplay without becoming repetitive. With the PG horror vibe the newer FNAF games are going for, it makes a lot of sense to make a game that intentionally takes this vibe and runs with it rather than half-heartedly attempting to cater to two different audiences. I'm working on a really long video detailing my favorite and most anticipated fan games of 2023 that will include this video, so stay tuned for that if you're interested. The fan games mentioned in this video just go to show how much of an impact FNAF continues to have and how immensely talented its community continues to be. There are also plenty of games for us to look forward to, like Forgotten at Fredbear's, Fazbear Facility, and Ultimate Custom Night Plus, all of which look amazing and the latter being the closest to being finished. Candyland's wishlist is currently on Steam, so we'll have to wait and see on that one. But with that, I hope you enjoyed my coverage on the current state of FNAF fan games. If you did, you'll probably enjoy this video on how FNAF can't die. Quick note, I'm transitioning these long form videos over to this other channel, so if you're not interested in my YouTube shorts, unsubscribe from this channel and subscribe to this other channel. Thanks for watching.